Step into the enigmatic realm of Paranormal M. We're your gateway to the unknown, bringing you stories that'll leave you perplexed. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to explore our latest supernatural tales. We hope you're ready for a journey that challenges your beliefs. Story number one, UFO sighting experience. Hey guys, I just finished watching the interview with Joe Rogan and David Fravor about his UFO sighting. Well, I decided I wanted to share an experience me and my brother had several years ago. I've told all of my family and friends, but I've never shared it online other than on my personal Facebook when it happened. My grandpa and two uncles used to work at NASA in various positions. My uncles both denied ever hearing about anything extraterrestrial while working there. Whereas my grandpa wouldn't tell me any specific stories, but he told me that we weren't alone and he knew. Anyway, I grew up in Cape Canaveral, Florida, but I now live in Georgia, about 20 minutes south of Atlanta, which is where this took place. So several years ago in summer, me and my brother rode in his truck to the gas station to get snacks and cigarettes. After we got our things, we decided to park in a space facing the road so we could smoke before we went home. My mom didn't know that we smoked at this time. We were sitting there and I remember distinctively that we were drinking Yoo-Hoo's and eating, eating hot Cheetos. Everything about this experience has stayed in my mind and whenever I visit that gas station or drink a Yoo-Hoo, I think about it and I think about what we saw. So we were sitting there just talking and I noticed something in the sky. I said, what's that? My brother looked and we saw five lights in the sky in a V formation. They weren't moving, but they were just sitting there. We do live close to Hartsfield-Jackson Airport, and we see planes all the time. These were not planes. It was in the middle of the day, and the lights were bright, and, like I said, not moving. Well, as we were staring at the lights, the top two lights at the top of the V flew in different directions extremely fast and then came back and joined the formation. This happened in about a second. Here's the best way I can describe the way the lights went. After that, the two middle lights did the same thing, flew quickly away and then back into the formation. Next, all of the lights scattered in different directions and didn't return. They disappeared. We were shocked by what we just saw and drove home quickly to tell our mom. I then posted it on Facebook asking anybody if they saw the lights in the sky and two other people who lived near me said that they did. Some people asked why I didn't take a picture or a video. Well, first off, when it happened, we were both so enamored by what we were seeing it didn't occur to me to pull out my phone. It all happened so fast, maybe in the span of about 45 seconds. Then we were so focused on what we were seeing that it didn't cross either of our minds. Second of all, at this time my brother had an iPhone that he left at home, and I only had a slide phone, so the camera wouldn't have been that good. Anyway, I think about the occurrence all the time. My brother is a no-nonsense type of person. He's a, he's a non-believer from anything from ghosts, Bigfoots, aliens, etc. I don't know really how to describe him, but definitely not somebody who would make up a UFO story. He might not even tell anyone just to keep himself from looking weird to others, but even he can't explain what we saw and will corroborate the story. Me? I'm very open-minded. And since this happened, I definitely believe in extraterrestrials and have become interested in other mysteries like cryptozoology, stuff like that. Ghost Camera So this is a quick story from back when I lived on Cherry Street in Muldoon, Alaska. My mom rented out a duplex when I was younger. We lived there for a few years. 
Weird things did happen in that house, but it never really fazed me all too much. Besides one time, but that's a different story. But I remember my mom had this gray camera. It was kind of like an old school one. We've taken a few pictures on it, and then after a while we just needed to throw it into a bin that had basically a bunch of electrical stuff in there. One day I was going through the box looking for a Wii controller, and I remembered the camera catching my eye. For some reason I felt like I had to charge it up and turn it on, so I did. Everything was normal until I went into the camera roll, and this is where things just went south. I started going through the pictures and seeing three pics that are in black, white, and gray. I'm not sure if that camera takes black and white pictures, but all the pictures that we've taken beforehand were all color. But when I looked at the first black and gray picture, I was weirded out. There was this girl, who seemed to be 12 or 13 years old, taking a selfie on the camera. Weird thing wasn't just me not knowing who that person was. It was also taken in her hallway right next to my bedroom door bookshelf. And the bookshelf that we had was filled with books and random stuff. But in the picture that was on the camera of the girl in the bookshelf was empty. And the only things that were on the bookshelf were skulls. But they didn't look like actual skulls. They were like see-through and smoky looking skulls. Kind of like a cloud, but in a perfect skull form. There was about three skulls to be exact. The other two pictures that were taken on the camera were just pictures of basically the bookshelf and the skulls on them. To this day, we have no freaking idea who or how that was possible. It's honestly really freaky and weird. It wasn't a previously used camera because my mom bought it brand new. And even if it was previously owned, how would that person or whatever she was have taken the picture in our house? I wish we would have kept that camera, or rather wouldn't have. But my grandmother was living with us at the time. They were kind of a super Jehovah's Witness, so she made us throw it away. No one in the house knew who she was. Some creepy stuff. Ghost Girl from the Camera Part 2 This was way back when I lived on Cherry Street, Muldoon in Anchorage. My dad came up to visit from Hawaii after he got out of jail. My mom was at work and he was there watching us. It was a pretty chill day. We were going to go to the zoo, so my dad decided that he would do my little sister's hair. They were sitting down in the recliner that was facing down in the hallway. Halfway through doing my sister's hair, he asked my older brother to go grab a comb for her hair. And me, being the nosy, ADHD-filled child I was, I got up and followed right behind my brother to go into my mom's room to grab the comb. As soon as we opened the door, we were greeted with an absolute cold breeze and the sight of a teenage-looking girl on the far side of my mom's bed. The bed wasn't up against the wall, it was in the middle of the room, so there was enough room on both sides of the bed to have a walking space. Me and my brother both froze instantly and looked down the hallway at my dad and little sister. At first we thought it was my sister for some reason, but nope, she was still there sitting, getting her hair done. And when me and my brother looked back, the girl was standing right in front of us. I'm talking like some horror movie stuff. Like I'm literally in the grudge. It was hella scary. At the time I was like seven or eight. Right after that, me and my brother booked it down the hallway and yelled out, Oh my god, there's a ghost in the room. My sister out of nowhere just threw the brush that she was holding down the hallway and it hit the fish tank at the end and broke it. Water was everywhere in the hall. And it was carpet. She said she threw the brush because when she looked up after we ran past, she said she'd seen the girl running after us. It was just so crazy. Like, I literally mean it when I say that it was like The Grudge, straight out of the movie. It was hella scary. It's probably one of the more serious encounters that I've ever had. I've had plenty more, but this one just about tops all of them. And if you read my story about the girl on the camera that I posted, I think this might have been her. Same long dark hair and same build. 
but in the picture on the camera, she didn't have a scary face or anything. She looked normal, like a regular person, but when I seen her with my own eyes, I couldn't see her face. It was covered by her hair. Grudge much. Story number four. Higher being or coincidence? So I live in Anchorage, Alaska. And if you know about Alaska or anyone in Alaska, nine out of 10 chances that they're gonna love fishing. That's what Alaska is all about in the summer. But anyways, I was chilling at home with my brother and out of nowhere he decided that he wanted to take a drive out to Kenai and do an overnight fishing trip. It was around 10.30 p.m. I had nothing to do considering that it was summer and I had no school. So I decided I'd go with him. We packed all of our stuff into his truck and by the time we were heading out, it was 11.30ish. It was dark and windy that night. But we said fuck it and kept going anyways. We were about an hour out from the spot that we were going to fish at. And all of a sudden it started to rain super hard. I mean like crazy hard. The wind was blowing hard as well. I could feel the truck swaying a little every now and then when a big gust would hit the truck. And if you're from Alaska or know a little bit about it, you'd know that driving from Anchorage to Kenai in that kind of weather isn't fun. And there's also not many places on the way. There are spots where it's nothing but woods for miles, no houses or anything for a while. And out of nowhere, I had this sudden urge to want to put my head down and ask to myself or whoever I was asking. Story number five, Shadow Man. So this is a story from back when I lived in DeRitter, Louisiana. I was around 12 when this was happening. So apparently the house we lived in was beforehand occupied by an older gentleman and his family. Never really knew much about it, but I heard a rumor from neighbors around saying that an older man died in the house that we were living in. It was a beautiful big house. The four beds, two baths, and a huge living room and dining room. It also had an office room that we would later use to turn into a bedroom. But the way the neighborhood was set up was a big square. Only one way into the neighborhood, and our house was on one of the corners of the big square. We didn't have any street lights around our house, and it was kind of sloped down into a ditch. So when it rained hard, it usually would flood the whole backyard and everything around it. The rest of the neighborhood was more elevated and had street lights. Our house was the only house that had no lights around it. It was honestly creepy at night when we were pulling into our driveway. But anyways, ever since we moved into that house, I always had this weird feeling like someone or something was watching me. It really never did too much damage because I thought that maybe it was just me being young and scared. But boy was I wrong. Many weird things happened in that house that were unexplainable. But one of the first things that started happening was I would see a dark shadow looking figure run past her garage door. We would usually leave the left garage door open and the right closed. And when the left was open, you could see right through our door that leads into the garage because it had a glass window. But I would randomly see this figure run past really fast. And I thought maybe it was just my eyes because I would catch it in the corner of my eye, but slowly and surely all of my siblings started to see it too. The siblings aged at the time were 2, 6, 8, 8, 16, 17, and me, 12. We never really mentioned it because it never really bothered any of us like a guess. But then it started to get more frequent and it made me curious and wonder if it really was a ghost or a spirit. So I decided to ask my brothers if they've seen it and they said yeah. They also thought that they've seen something run past a few times. And as we were talking in the kitchen my mom and stepdad at the time came out of the room and just came to talk about it. They too said that they've also seen the figure as well. And at that moment that we were all standing by the garage door, we all saw it run past. 
My stepdad swung open the door and ran out. Everyone followed right after him. It took no more than two to three seconds to get outside. Our backyard was massive and there was absolutely nowhere that a person could have ran and hid from us without us seeing them. Then there was woods at the end of our backyard, but it was at least a hundred meters or more. We were all standing outside looking like we were crazy people. And from there on, we just knew that there had to be something paranormal. A little after that, weird things started to happen and it got a little bit more interesting. Nothing that was absolutely crazy enough to drive us off and run away from the house, but creepy enough to look back on it and say to myself that I've definitely seen some ghostly stuff. Story number six. I need answers. My best friend and I were outside having a late night conversation. We live in a very small town on the edge of the forest in the middle of the Great Canadian Shield, a very large forest that covers central Canada. It was around 2 a.m. when we were suddenly hearing a howl that was picked up on a few other calls. Nothing strange yet but it picked up more and more howls until the point that it sounded like there was a hundred of thousands of wolves. Initially, my friend and I tried yelling over the sound, but even though we were right next to each other, we couldn't hear one another. It got so loud at the end that we couldn't even think to ourselves. It was mind-numbing. Then as suddenly as it started, the howls died out. It went quickly from hundreds of thousands to four or five then one or two, and then silence. Not one howl for the rest of the night. The thing is, we have absolutely no mountains. It's flat forest land. Not only that, but we have wolves in the area. Though not that many for sure, but no one else in the neighborhood heard the sounds when we asked around. My best friend's mother lives closer to the sound, and is a light sleeper who had her window open and she heard nothing. My grandmother either, whose house that we were standing in front of, nothing again. We had no idea what to make of this event. Finally, after six months, I realized something bone-chilling. No one heard us either. What happened to us, or our voices? Did we have a shared hallucination? If so, why did no one still hear just us screaming to each other then? This never happened again. Has anybody else out there, anywhere, ever had an experience like this or something similar? Or maybe as a theory on what has happened, I'll take anything. This is a true story that happened when I was 16, 23 now, and I still have no idea what could have happened. Story number seven eerie voice captured after painful moan while sleeping. So my sister contacted me today, informing that her mom was freaking out due to sound captured while my mom was sleeping in the middle of the night. Keep in mind, my mom has recently divorced and has just recently become an empty nester about five months ago. Never heard that term before, empty nester. Anyhow, backstory. My sister, let's call her Sis, had noticed about a month ago that my mom was gasping for error. Never heard that before either. While my mom was taking a nap. Being a nurse, suggested that she speak with the doctor about potentially having sleep apnea. Mom, being as stubborn as she is, instead downloaded an app from the app store to record sounds while she was sleeping. My mom started to record herself about two weeks ago. Over those past two weeks, she would review the sounds the following morning. She did hear some knocking sounds, but assumed it was either her hand hitting the top of the bed or just random house creaking noises. The home my mom lives in is a new build, roughly two years old, and was built on what we believe to be normal farmland. Her dog, a 12-year-old Maltese, 
over the last two to three months would wake up barking at two to three a.m. My mom thought someone in the neighborhood was getting up for work and spooking him. So she moved him to sleep in another room so she wouldn't be woken up. Also, over that time, I just found out today that my mom also complained about scratches on her back. That was in places that she couldn't reach. She showed this to my sister, grandfather, and grandmother. They thought maybe the dog was scratching her, but she believes she would have felt and remembered that. To her knowledge, this has happened around four times. Well, this morning my mom got up, checked the recordings, and heard the above audio. My sister said that she called her in a fuss, freaking out about the audio that she captured over the night. My sister went over, heard the video, having no explanation, decided to forward it along to me. I was skeptical and laughing as I got the video, thinking that it was just another instance of my mom and sister being irrational. As soon as I heard the video, the hair on my neck and arms stood up. This is mainly due to the fact that it clearly sounds like somebody else is in that room with her. The creepy piece is that you can clearly hear my mom moan in pain and start to roll over in bed before the voice speaks. On top of that, the voice sounds very confident and, in my opinion, ominous. The words don't sound like any words I know when I speak German and English and neither my mom nor my mother. That's confusing. Neither my mom nor my mother have any sort of technical background to make this sort of prank and send it to me. Also, they forwarded it using the, using the app's forwarding mechanism via email, in all caps. So I knew without a doubt that this was coming straight from the app. I asked the following questions and received the following answers. Does mom sleep with the fan on? No, she hasn't slept with the fan for two to three years. Was the TV on when she fell asleep? She doesn't have a TV in her bedroom. Again, new house, I don't visit much. Three, what kind of pillow and mattress does she have? Could it have made the sound of air being let out when she turned over? She has a memory foam pillow and mattress. My sister jumped on the bed and rolled over it with no hissing air sounds coming from any place. After exhausting all rational ideas, I started googling and searching for paranormal things that could have caused this. We did find that my mom has a mirror on the dresser and had another makeup mirror on that same dresser. They were facing each other. But I have to be honest and say that I'm not sold on the paranormal idea of being gateways when that happens. I'm not going to say what I think the voice is, or what it's saying, as I don't want to impact anybody's opinion. We did find a couple of meanings in different languages, but I'd really like native speakers of those languages to identify and tell me what they believe it's saying. After finally running out of paranormal ideas, I decided to be like every other human being and turn to all of you on Reddit for help. Please tell me that there's a valid explanation for this so we can put the issue to rest. My mom is saying she's 100% set on selling her place, which may not be a bad idea given she's an empty nester and that house is too big anyway, but that's a lot of effort for, hopefully, an easy explanation. You may ask why the video was blurry. Again, I received the file directly from the app via email, and it had the marketing of that app on it. The video was failing to upload to Giphy Cat and Giphy, which just a few try again links. They just kept popping up. I figured there may be some sort of blocker on advertisements and went into the window photo app video editor, selected the arcade filter to blur it and re-upload. Another day, another dollar. Story number eight. We've named him Tim. Most of my mornings start at 3.30 a.m. I pull myself out of bed and stumble around until I get to work around four. 
Typically, there are two of us to open. A baker, who makes all of my donuts, and me, the opening manager, who makes all the coffees. This particular morning, I was late, 15 minutes late, but enough to scare my baker into thinking that I had just left him to his own devices till 7 a.m. when the rest of the employees came in. As the general manager, I see and hear everything that goes down in my store. I had heard the spooky stories about Tim knocking over cups and causing a ruckus. To me, Tim was an imaginary person that everybody liked to joke about. Even I did, saying that, Oh no, this spill on the counter must have been Tim. Shame on him. We laughed and joked about him and blamed him for all of our problems. It kept spirits light and gave us a scapegoat when something went wrong. Now, if you've seen my previous stories, you'll know that I am a firm believer and that I've had plenty of experiences myself. Tim, however, was a fake ghost. I was sure it was just a running joke. I walked in at 4.15 a.m. to find my baker standing in the front of the line and not in the back where his station was. Eyes wide and a scared expression. I immediately got worried. I asked what was wrong and he just said, there's someone else in here. So here we were, a small coffee shop located right in front of the city jail. Attempted break-ins are a regular thing with the colder weather. Inmates were released and their ride never showed, just looking for a warm place to spend the night. My baker rattled off how he had heard the cooler door open and shut. Then someone shuffling across the beverage station. He went around the corner thinking I'd come in while perhaps he was just not being able to hear quite well enough from the freezer. He then heard running down the back hall and our swinging door being slammed open and the person go out into the dining room where I was currently standing. Our security system sends alarms out when doors are opened without the code. My baker said that he had not heard the alarm. A manhunt ensued. I searched every single place a person could be. We looked for signs of a break-in, signs of a robbery, something. I took him to the office, we locked the doors behind us, and we checked the cameras. 4.12 a.m., my cooler door did open. A couple seconds later in the swinging door, just like my baker said, he sits in the parking lot for me now and waits until I get there. We've been keeping it to ourselves. Story number nine. Thing in my house from my baby. I've just had a baby. Well, just being two months ago. I'm having no sleep, I'm cranky, and those who know this stage know how difficult that it is. Regardless, weird things have been going on in our house ever since bringing the baby home from the hospital. It first started with strange smells. I know what you're thinking, nappies and such, but I assure you it wasn't those or my daughter. I would be feeding her and putting her in the crib next to me, going to go get a bottle of water out of the fridge. Upon entering the kitchen, which is down the stairs and a few more rooms away, it smelt like rotting garbage. That's the best way I can describe it. I thought the kitchen sink was blocked up again and made a mental note to mention it to my husband in the morning. So I mentioned it, and he took it apart. Nothing. No blockage. No smell. It seems like this smell moves from room to room. Next, I'm awake mostly at night. I would hear three loud random knocks on our bedroom door. My husband and I would be in bed and nobody else would be in the house. We only live with it being us three, myself, my husband, and our baby. I thought I was losing my mind or so sleep deprived that I was making it up or maybe someone f fell one time and my imagination just hung on to that. I don't know. Happened every night. 
I'd open the door and see no one there. No windows open, nothing. Like I said, I thought I was going crazy until my husband stayed up with her one night while I got some rest. I hastily got into bed and willed myself off to sleep in case he changed his mind. And the next thing, I'm getting shook awake. It's my husband asking if I heard the knocks. Okay. Not just me. I told him not to worry and went back to sleep. No one was going to ruin my very rare nap time. I now keep having dreams of this figure. It's a shadow man, but I can make out some features. It seems to have four sets or horns on its head, and it's pitch black. Sort of like a black swirl, if that makes sense. In my first dream, it was standing in the door hallway, blocking me from exiting. It was blacker than the room and had red eyes. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of dread. Then my daughter cried, woke up from that dream. The next one is right over my daughter's crib and staring at us. I told my husband about this also. As in a look how crazy I am with no sleep sort of way. He went white. He grabbed me and the baby and the next thing we were sitting in the car. He said he didn't want it to hear us. He told me that he was trying to nap one lunchtime as I was out with our baby shopping. And he thought, why not? He awoke to this black swirly thing right next to him, its face inches away from his. He said it didn't have a face just had four black shadow horn outlines and a wispy black body. Its head was on the same pillow as my husband's. That's how close they were. He told me he jumped backwards as a sort of oh crap moment. And when he did, the figure folded in on itself and left. And not without that god awful smell. What is this? What do we do? I want my daughter to be safe. Story number 10. I've seen a crying thing, and it really scares me. Hi, everybody. This happened to me just last night, and I don't know how to explain it. For a bit of context, my father recently became ill, so I've moved home to help out my mother for a while. I still have young siblings and a grandparent living in the house so I decided to stay in my parents' caravan out back. They only use it in the summer, so I thought I could get some privacy. The caravan gets cold at night, so my dad gave me an electric heater to warm it up. But my mother is very worrisome, and is worried leaving it on overnight could start a fire. And I promise this will be relevant. So last night I go to sleep, and around 4 a.m. I hear banging on my window. I jump up, open the curtain, and my mother was standing there. Not gonna lie, I was a little worried something happened to my father, but she was just there to tell me to turn the heater off. I say, okay, great, thanks for waking me up for that. Then I try to get some sleep. This is where the weirdness begins. Just as I turn over, I hear very faint crying. At first I thought it was somebody in the house, but it was coming from the direction of the shed behind the caravan. I think to myself, it's just some fox or other animal, but it slowly starts getting louder. Not extremely loud, but loud enough that it was keeping me up. I fling the curtains open to scare whatever animal was out there, but it was no animal. A child-sized shadow thing was sitting against the shed, its head in its knees crying. I've never jumped up so fast in my life. I instantly turned on all the lights and ran back to the window, but it was gone, and the crying had stopped. I quickly jotted down all the features of it so I wouldn't forget, and stayed up with all the lights on that night. 
I'm scared it'll come back. Does anybody have any info on what this could be? It was child-sized, and it was like a shadow. The only features I could see was its body shape. Never been so scared in my life. Story number 11. An Angelic Encounter. I was about 14 years old and at church for a Christmas program. During the program, I noticed someone seated nearby that had something unusual about them. Some kind of special energy. I noticed this person watching me several times. Thought it was a little odd, but I wasn't worried about it. He had a kind face that radiated interest and concern and was dressed in a light blue satin baseball jacket, jeans, and a solid white Nike tennis shoe outfit. After the program was over, I was in another part of the church with family and friends. While we were talking out of the corner of my eye, I saw the man again. He was at the other end of the room leaning against the corner that led to the hallway. He was watching me intently simply staring without looking away at all. By this time, I was thinking that he must be an angel, perhaps my own guardian angel. Whoever he was, I wanted answers. I pretended to keep talking to people and took two steps backward away from the group. When I was good and clear, I took off running straight toward the man as fast as I could. When he saw this, he jumped away from the corner, turned down the hallway, and ran as fast as he could. I was only a few yards behind him. The hallway was a blank wall on the left side, and on the right side were three doors. He went into the middle one. All right, I thought to myself, door number two it is. I caught up within seconds and stepped into the doorway. Just as I spotted him in the room... I saw him throw what looked like a whole ream of copy paper directly at me like a frisbee. The paper came flying right at my face, so I turned my head quickly and covered my face with my arms. A second or two later, when I realized that the paper hadn't hit me, I lowered my arms to see a completely empty Sunday school room, with sheets of paper going everywhere, drifting toward the floor like giant snowflakes. The man was not there, and he had vanished. There was only one door into that room, and I was standing in it. He had not pushed past me to get out. The only windows were little rectangular ones up high that didn't open. And I don't think a person could fit through one anyway. I called out after him. That's not fair. I walked away fairly certain my first instinct was correct. I also wondered if all angels wore white Nikes. Didn't pick up on the paper either. I was just too stunned. Story number 12. They could be why I survived. I was walking with two friends to take one home after school. We had to walk up a dodgy country road, and it was away from the surrounded towns. It was still daylight outside, being around 16, and there was tall bushes on either side of the road. We got about halfway up onto a straight bit, and I saw on the other side, standing inside the bushes, two really tall, slim, black silhouettes. They didn't look like real people, but they had the body of one and about seven feet tall. I had stopped and said to the other two, The fuck was that? They turn around and say, What? But I said it was nothing, and I just thought I was seeing things. A couple of minutes after this, my friend stopped and said the same thing. You could hear that she was spooked. She explained to us that she saw the exact same thing. We all started freaking out. We ended up dropping my friend off and having to walk back the way we came. When me and my friend reached the bottom of that road, not far from where I saw them, 
we both got hit by a car pretty bad. She luckily, or rather, she got lucky and knocked by the headlight and fell to the side, whereas I got hit and went over the bonnet and the roof and slid down the side, getting stuck on the wing mirror and dragged around the corner. The car was going around 50 miles an hour when it had hit us. I believe I should have died, but instead I came out of it with only one broken leg. I obviously had big grazes, but only broke one single bone. None of these injuries have stayed with me. I've got no scars or anything. I think about this all the time and how it's all such a coincidence. How there was two of them and two of us got hit by the car on the same road only about 40-ish minutes later. I would love to know what people have to think about this because I think about this a lot. My Strange Experience Story number 13 I was about seven years old. It was summer, and we were in the usual place that we had always frequented from July to August. That day I remembered that I had to learn to use the bicycle, and so I asked my mother if I could go to the yard to try. My mom gave me the okay, and there I went. Just outside of the building I met a little older child, maybe 10 or 11 years old, and he asked me if I lived there. In short, we didn't know each other, and he told me that he was the son of two gentlemen who had rented the house next to ours, with the street number three. I immediately understood who he was referring to, and we made friends. I told him that I had to learn to pedal the bike, and I had to practice. He replied that he could help me. Being older, he already knew how to carry it. We spent the whole afternoon pedaling the bike down a slope and then climbing it, but being inexperienced when I happened to make the descent, I couldn't break in time and I tumbled. The boy was laughing and so was I, to tell the truth, because in the end I wasn't hurt. Anyway, the afternoon ended, and both the boy and I had to go and say goodbye. I went home and told that I had met this child, and my mother understood who I was referring to, because the day before she had talked to the gentleman who had rented that house, and she knew that they had a son. The next day came. I woke up happy, knowing that I could spend another day having fun with my new friend. So I went down and knocked on the couple in the villa number three. As soon as they opened, I asked them if their son was in the house. They then looked at me with a very strange air. Then they answered me, saying that maybe I had the wrong door. They didn't have a son. so. Thinking that I had misunderstood, I asked them if they had a nephew who had come to play yesterday. They said no, and so I greeted them. You can't imagine my face at that moment. I wondered for who knows how long who did I play with yesterday. But the thing that troubled me is that my mother knew him. She had confirmed me all a day before. So I went back home and told my mother about the situation. I still remember her answer. She told me that yesterday I had not gone down, I had stayed at home playing with toys until the evening. I told her about the boy in villa number three, but she didn't, she didn't understand what I was talking about since they had no children. At this point I was convinced this was a joke, I insisted so much that she got angry. I remember that I looked at my arms and legs looking for bruises due to the bike, but there was nothing also because I actually didn't hurt myself by falling. People, I swear to you, I still don't know what happened. I can't explain why the day before my mother knew about this family and the day after she didn't. I also checked in the following days, but nothing, never saw that kid again. After 30 years, I still can't explain this story to myself. A weird dream? Maybe but I'm sure it was all true. I remember that moment very well, 
moment by moment, colors, noises, smells, all of it. The child was from another house, and then after the holidays he went away. Okay, but why didn't my mother remember it anymore? Who were you referring to then when you told me about the family in Villa Number 3? A journey into another dimension, a very fervent fantasy, a ghost, a misunderstanding, an extremely realistic dream. I don't know how to explain it, but I think that from the event that I started to be more mentally open to these stories and to those who tell them. Story number 14. I believe myself and my girlfriend may be in danger after an experience that we shared last night. I need any help or advice because I'm at a loss. Last night my girlfriend took me to an allegedly haunted house on the outskirts of the county. Her brother and his friends stumbled on it when they were in high school. She's been there several times but swears that nothing like what occurred last night has ever happened. We had to drive down a secluded highway for about 20 minutes and then turn down a shoddy gravel road for a quarter mile or so just to reach the place. There's a pull-off on the gravel road that leads up to the rusted wrought iron gate and a concrete sign that reads, Charlie E., former slave. Can't make out the last name girlfriend took a picture of the time that she went before with her brother, and I'll get her to send it to me and update the post when she wakes up. Anyway, as soon as our headlights hit the gate, I just felt an overwhelming dread and fear. I'd felt perfectly fine as we made our way up the gravel road, but as soon as the gate, sign, and forested area around the abandoned house were lit up, I felt incredibly anxious. We sat and talked for a bit, never leaving the car. We talked about what Charlie must have suffered through, and how we hoped he'd find happiness and peace and freedom. We pondered what kind of man he was, and how he would feel about events in the world today. It just seemed respectful, almost like visiting a grave or a monument. I was mid-sentence when another overwhelming wave of dread came out of nowhere. My girlfriend must have felt it too, because she grabbed my arm and said, Okay, we have to go now. I hesitated just a moment, and she squeezed and said, Okay, you can back up now, with a slightly panicked tone in her voice. I threw the car into reverse, headed back down the gravel road toward the highway. As soon as our tires hit the pavement, I started to hear a deep buzzing noise all around us. The hair on my body stood up straight. The buzzing finally faded into, I don't even know, it was low and high at the same time, like a scream and a bellow combined. I could feel it reverberate in my chest and the noise surrounded as though it came from inside the car. It only lasted maybe ten seconds total and then warped into a twisted cackling sound. I'm not kidding, it sounded like a stereotypical witch's cackle. I looked over at my girlfriend to ask if she'd heard that, but the lack of color and the look on her face when I told her is all I needed to know. She sat quiet for about a minute and then shakily said, did, did you hear that? What the fuck was that? I nodded my head and said, I have no idea. We hauled ass all the way back to civilization and went to a friend that's a practicing Wiccan to cleanse ourselves in the car with sage. The cleansing didn't make a heavy feeling or the dread leave either of us. I'm still pretty shaken up about it today. Can't find any information about the house, Charlie, or even the road where it's located on Google. I can get satellite images of the area, but there's no street view. Can't find any information through the Country Properties appraiser's website, but can't even figure out who owns the land. I feel like what happened was a clear message that we aren't welcome and to stay away. The intense feeling of dread that are still with me today reaffirm that. So first and foremost, 
How do I protect myself and my girlfriend from anything that may have attached to us or followed us home? And secondly, I'm going back alone and during the daytime. I need to know what's there and what happened there. How do I protect myself in that situation? Can't exactly blast a malevolent spirit with a buckshot. Story number 15, Knocks on My Window. So four nights ago, I was sitting at my vanity, taking off my makeup after work. My vanity sits directly in front of my window, so when I'm sitting at it, I can see out of it. It faces west. Anyway, I'm close to done and reach for my drink, which was just to my right on the vanity, when I heard three very loud knocks on my window. I jumped up and back and then threw my can of soda in the process and started looking all around my backyard through the window, thinking that somebody was out there. The light was on in the back and I could see everything within at least eight feet of my window. So I decided to brush it off, told myself I was being silly and it was just the wind as there was a mild breeze. Granted that there was and is absolutely nothing near my window that could hit it, even with strong winds, but whatever. So I sat back down and started cleaning the spilled soda and finished my makeup removal. Less than five minutes pass, and again, three very distinct knocks directly on top of my window, but slightly softer this time. Again, I jumped up and looked all around my window, only to see absolutely nothing and no one. I said, screw this, and went to shower as I had planned to. A few minutes into my shower, I heard what I thought was my husband walking down the hall. The house sits up about four feet off the ground, so on four by fours. I think they're four by fours anyway. So any time that we'd walk around, it's very audible due to the space beneath the floor and the actual ground. So I yelled his name and poked my head out of the bathroom because I wanted to tell him about the knocks. Well, from my bedroom, I can see directly into our bedroom. Or from my bathroom, I can see directly into our bedroom. And he was laying in the bed, sawing logs loud enough that I could hear it over the shower running. Not an abnormal thing. I chalked the walking around noise that I heard to the house settling, shut the bathroom door again. And before I could even turn away from the door, I heard footsteps running back and forth up and down the hall from the living room toward the end of the hall and back. This only went on for 30, maybe 45 seconds, but it terrified me. Cut my shower short, hopped into bed and fell asleep. Cut to last night, I'm in my den watching TV and I hear three knocks outside that sounded exactly like the ones I've heard days prior. My window is only about five feet away from the window, and it's in the den. By the way, my house is kind of L-shaped, and I swear it sounded like somebody was knocking on my window again. I have no idea what's going on, but if anybody has any sort of input, including rationale or explanations, please share. I'm kind of freaked out by all this. My Freaky Husband We moved into a house in Northamptonshire a few years ago and instantly felt something was odd with the house. That feeling when someone's watching you, cold drafts. My husband started feeling compelled to say things, like he'd tell me what I'd done during the day with eerie detail. He'd tell me about a girl who talked to him, but in his head. Things started going missing or would be moved to random places. One day he said Gungoozler out of the blue. Never heard that word, nor has he. I just assumed it was another one of his made-up words. But it turns out it's a word meaning somebody who enjoys watching canals. There are a lot of canals in the area, one in the village. When I asked why he said that word... He told me the girl had said it to him, and she loved the canal. 
The weirdest thing that happened, though, was one evening when my... Ouch. Was one evening when both my husband and our daughter wanted shower. They decided Hubby would go first, but as we sat in our bed... Or, ouch. Sorry. Stubbed my toe somehow. Where am I? Jogging back, they decided Hubby would go first. But as we sat in our bedroom, we heard the bathroom door close. The light go on and the shower start. So we assumed our daughter must have just beaten him to it. The shower ran for 45 minutes and just as we were going to check that she was okay, we heard the shower stop and her come out of the bathroom and go downstairs. The light was left on. My husband turned off the light, followed her downstairs, and watched her go into her bedroom, which was also downstairs. As he walked into the kitchen, our daughter walked in the back door. When he asked how she'd gotten dressed and out so quickly, she told him that she's been out of the house for the last hour, seeing to her horses. So, who was in the shower? We saw a girl again a few weeks later, also stood in her daughter's doorway. Lots of other strange things happened there. But never anything scary, just freaky. Anyway, we moved a couple of years ago. Nothing's happened since. Until this weekend, we went away to a hotel in Cornwall. On the first night, it was very foggy and cold. As we stood outside having a cigarette, he suddenly said, John, Joan is waiting in the summer house. I asked what on earth he was talking about. He had a strange look on his face and said, Joan is waiting in the summer house for Derek. Then he sort of snapped out of it, mouth hanging open, and said, I have no idea where that came from. We talked about it and he said he felt compelled to say those things. He also felt that she was military. We carried on discussing it for a while, then mid-sentence he said, He's married, and she's waiting in the summer house. A bit spooked, we decided to go back to our room. We searched on the internet and found out that in 1946, a young woman who was serving in the Navy was stationed at the hotel. Her name was Joan. She was having an affair with a married officer. When they were found out, she was transferred to another site in Devon. On the night she was due to move, she was waiting for him in the summer house where he shot her twice in the head. His name was William. We were totally freaking out. The man's name was wrong, but at that time people used to be known by other names frequently. Like my granddad was John, but was called Jack. And my grandma was Grace, but was called Queenie. Perhaps he was really known as Derek. Story number 17. The Garage Door. It was June of 1972 that my mom and dad told me that they were taking a couple of our thoroughbred racehorses to Durango, California. This is where my father owned land, and where we typically boarded some of the animals during the summer. This trip was nothing unusual, as it had occurred rather frequently. The only difference this time was that my mother was going with my dad instead of me. I guess dad figured that at 13 I was old enough and responsible enough to do the morning and evening chores, which consisted of feeding and watering the remaining horses, which numbered to about eight few cows, six pigs, and a coop full of chickens. There were also a few wounds to be smeared with ointment. These chores were not exactly rocket science, but it did take a while, so I was glad when Lyle offered to come with me and help each evening. He got a kick out of it as he enjoyed that kind of thing. I, however, leaned more towards the arts, performing magic, singing, playing the piano, and even doing ventriloquism. In fact, I did it professionally by the time I was 12. I had no intention of staying at the house alone while my parents were gone in Colorado. I was very much afraid of the dark, especially of being alone. 
It would be years until I discovered why, but I was going to spend the weekend with two of my best neighbor's buddies, Lyle and Mark Harper. Lyle was a year older than I was, and Mark was a year younger, so I fit right in the middle of the two. They lived just three houses to the west of my house. I can't really call it a house that I lived in. It was one of the four duplexes that my dad owned. Two of them were built back in the early 1920s, and the other two were newer, as they were built by my dad a couple of years after we moved there in the late 1960s. The two old units, A and B, and the two new units, C and D, were split down the middle by our long asphalt driveway. The only other building on the property was a very old and very large white stucco garage shop, which was located behind the unit in the end of the driveway. Beyond that old shop was the corrals and pastures. With my parents in Colorado, I was in charge of keeping all the animals fed. Darkness was just around the corner, so I took Lyle and we headed to my place. As we entered my driveway, we started walking between the old units and the new units toward the big garage. What made this shop so unique were the giant rolling stainless steel doors, one on the left and one on the right, and that met in the middle. It created almost a mirror effect, but not quite shiny enough to be a mirror. I happened to be looking at the door, noticing how the streetlight on 8th Avenue created just enough light to make our stretched shadows lightly appear on the big metal doors. I commented to Lyle that I wish I was that tall in real life. And that's when it happened. With both of us looking at her very light shadows bouncing off to the rhythm of our steps, another shadow, only very dark, no, like black, so black it looked like a thick, inky, one-dimensional entity. It ran clumsily across the shiny door from left to right. It was wearing what looked like a wide-brimmed fedora hat. It had a troll-like appearance, all hunched over as though it didn't want to be seen. It scurried quickly in total silence until it reached the right side of the doors, after which it completely disappeared. We both stopped, frozen in our tracks, trying to comprehend what we had just witnessed. Before either of us could say anything, the thick, dark shadow man trotted back the other direction, once again disappearing as it reached the other side of the doors. Both of our minds instantly realized that nothing solid had run between us and the doors, and that the only way a shadow could be that dark was, well, there was just no way a regular shadow could be that dark. Without uttering a word, we both turned in sync, as though the move was choreographed, and took off running back to 8th Avenue. Neither of us stopped until we arrived back to the safety of Lyle's house. Once inside, we ran to his father, Lloyd, who was watching the news on television. We told him that we needed him. We related our experience, and he said that he was sure there was a logical explanation. I knew, though, that there was not. He walked back to my house with us, and we began to experiment attempting to recreate a shadow that was as dark as what we had seen just ten minutes before. It just wasn't possible. Mr. Harper agreed to stay with us a while while I did my chores in the now dark back pasture. It would be years later that I would learn about shadow figures and how they operate. Since then, I've been blessed or cursed with several paranormal experiences, from full-body apparitions to simply feeding the presence, or rather, feeling the presence of spirits. I'm not sure why me, but I'm grateful for these experiences. Story number 18. Experiences growing up in my hometown. This first one happened when I was really little. I'd say in 2004, maybe. Maybe 2003. I suck with dates, but this was one of the first experiences that I had. It was pretty fuzzy. All I remember is being at the top of the flight of stairs and jumping down the whole thing. Almost like I could float down. 
I looked back on this one and I thought that maybe I had fallen down the stairs and didn't remember. But in that case, I would have gotten a shit ton of scrapes and bruises because it was a big wooden staircase. Likely not related to the other experiences that I had, but still, weird, weird. There was some weird shit in between these two, but I'd rather just get to the meat of it for now. Anyways, here's the biggest one that really bothers me. When I was in middle school, I was a rebellious little shitbag and decided to try running away from home in the fall of 2014. I got up in the middle of the night and just decided to walk straight down the road. Not sure what my plan was there, but anyways, I ended up just following the highway until I ended up around Thunderbolt, east of where I lived, and was stupidly proud of myself for not chickening out and that I'd stopped crying. Anyhow, I wandered some more, hopped some fences, and amid my dumbass adrenaline high, I ended up in this dense, trashy woods. I started thinking over shit and crying again. Then I heard what sounded like my mom calling out my name from up on the highway, and instinctively ran away from it. Once again, I was a stupid shit-stained kid. I remember looking up to the highway and just seeing a person go limp and fall off the side and under the overpass in my direction, then started running towards me on all fours like some kind of creature. It was super dark and I couldn't make out any features at all, and I wasn't interested in getting any closer. I just ran like the damn wind until my legs were shaking and I sat down in the underbrush. I was resting for a bit and shaking and crying and all that, and then I heard my mom calling me again. It sounded like it was the same exact vo or voice and volume. Like it was from the same distance away. It almost sounded like a mosquito buzzing super quietly in my ear. Passed out for the night and found my way back home in the morning. If we stay here, we'll never be seen again. Story number 19. In August of 2019, my family and I went on a trip to Bath, England. B-A-T-H. Sorry, don't know how to pronounce that. Bath? 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 Bath. We'd been there before, but hadn't had chance to visit the Roman sites. Unfortunately, when we arrived, we found that the Airbnb that we had booked was absolutely filthy. We weren't willing to stay there, couldn't find anything else. So we had to call off the trip and head home. Still haven't seen the Roman sites. It was a really long trip, and we'd already been ready to settle down for the evening when we arrived at the Holiday Flat. So the journey back stretched well into the night. My sister was incredibly tired and wanted to stop the night in the hotel, so we pulled into a travel lodge. As soon as we pulled in, I was instantly reminded of various footage I'd seen of people moments before they disappeared. I got the inexplicable and chilling feeling that had we stayed, the hotel CCTV would be the last thing anybody would see of us. I was absolutely freaked out, but everybody was super tired and fed up. I didn't want to cause problems. Thankfully, there were some complications with check-in. Despite her being the one who wanted to stop for the night, my sister insisted that we leave and push through to home. As soon as we left, the feeling began to dissipate, though I was very shaken. On the journey home, my mom mentioned that it was the Travel Lodge Shropshire, where many years previously we had stayed on another failed weekend break but had to abandon the trip and leave the hotel in the middle of the night to go home early because it was absolutely infested with fleas from stray cats and the stank of their pee. Could I have remembered this and had some sort of flashback to an unpleasant childhood experience? Maybe. Though, whilst I do remember that failed trip, all travel lodges look identical and I couldn't see the building in the pitch darkness anyway. Last week I told my sister about the ominous feeling that I had. She said that she had felt exactly the same way, and that's why she insisted that we move on. To this day, why we felt like that's a mystery. 
but I know had we stayed that night, the unexplained mystery would be of our disappearance. Story number 20. A friendly being in the dark. So it was during a really intense examination period when I was having trouble sleeping due to stress. At night, I'd lay awake in our pitch dark room, unable to make a single sound or movement because my sister was asleep on the bed beside mine. We had a bathroom in our room, and the door was a bit wonky. It raised unevenly off the floor, so if the lights were left on in the bathroom, it appeared as a strip of light in our bedroom. One of these nights, I looked over to find that my sister had accidentally left the light on in the bathroom. I thought about going to switch it off, but that train of thought ceased when I saw movement. A black shadow visible against the light moving around in the bathroom. There was nothing inside that could make the shadow, and it had never appeared before that moment. I watched as though in a trance as it moved. No discernible figure was like a mass of darkness writhing in place. As I watched, I felt fear, but at the same time was overcome by an odd sense of calm. I went to sleep within minutes. The shadow continued to appear, as I'd left the bathroom light on on purpose so I could discern more about this shadow. At one point I got brave. Since it was in the bathroom, I rationalized that it wouldn't come through the door if I got off the bed. Thinking this, I switched on the light in our room and opened the door to the bathroom. There was nothing. I'd figured out by now that looking at the shadow entity helped me sleep, so I'd fallen into a habit of switching on the bathroom light at night and watching it. One day I forgot to leave the light on. I stared into the dark, hoping I could make out the shadow creature's entrancing, writhing movement. And to my delight, I could. Except this time I realized I had been sorely mistaken. The placement of our bathroom door is such that it's the darkest part of the room. One would scarcely notice a grown man standing there, much less a shadow. I stared at the dancing shadow and trailed my eyes upward as the realization dawned on me that the creature had never been inside the bathroom. I only thought so because of the contrast of light against dark. It was tall, a pillar of shadow that reached the top of the doorway and a little higher. Where its head must have been, the writhing mass was a little larger, a thinner portion just below what could have been a neck. I was afraid of it then. I considered calling to my mother for help, but a thought came into my head. It wasn't my own thought that came into my head. It had a voice in a way that your own thoughts don't. Like reading dialogue from a book, I suppose. It was a voice that was ethereal, almost like it didn't even speak at all. After each word, I thought I'd imagine the voice and then the next word would come. You're safe. I won't hurt you. Go to sleep now didn't sound like it was ordering me. As soon as the voice stopped talking, the usual calm I feel when looking at the entity became much stronger, but not in a forceful way. It was like being surrounded by a warm breeze. I was sitting up in bed trying to fight off the feeling, but the thing came closer to me and surrounded me. It was like a barrier and a blanket. I slept then. I've never rested so well before. For the first time in a long time, I didn't dream. After that night, I didn't see the shadow ever again. I told my mother about leaving, but as I had told her about its arrival, I didn't tell her it spoke to me. No matter how much I try, I've never been able to sleep as peacefully as I had during those days. That's the end of tonight's stories. As always, leave a like and a comment if you feel like being engaged with us and helping us push this further along, so to speak. See ya.